Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining us. My name is Robert Colville. I'm director of the Center for Policy Studies, and I'm delighted to introduce this speech by uh, the Right Honourable Liz Truss, Minister for Women and Equality. Uh, where at the CPS a, a few, few years ago, we were trying to think of the words which define what we're about, what our, what our, what our mission was. And the three words we came up with were enterprise, ownership and, and opportunity. And of those three words, opportunity is the one which really doesn't get uh, as much attention as it perhaps should. Um, you know, it, we talk a lot about the free market. We talk a lot about some um, ways to make people richer and more prosperous. But fundamentally, there's also the, uh, an issue of fairness that it it really matters that everyone gets gets the same chance in life, gets the same treatment in life, that everyone is is, is running the same race, being treated in, in the same way. And that's why I'm so very happy to uh, introduce the Secretary of State today to be um, speaking on these really important issues. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Liz Truss. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Rob. No matter your skin colour, sexuality, religion or anything else, the United Kingdom is one of the best places in the world to live. The British story has been driven from its earliest days by the desire for liberty, agency and fairness. It's the notion that in Britain, you will have the opportunity to succeed or whatever you wish to do professionally, that you can be whoever you want to be, you can dress however you want to dress, you can love however you want to love and achieve your dreams. But we must be honest, our story is not yet complete. Our equality journey isn't finished. For too many people, particularly in places beyond the Southeast, opportunity is diminished. For years, successive governments have either pretended that all opportunity was equal or failed to come up with proper solutions, paying lip service to a problem that has festered for decades. It was this government that finally tore down the social taboo when we were elected to level up the country and toppled the red wall, turning it blue. We were elected partly on the promise of fixing the scourge of geographic inequality and ensuring equal opportunity for all. There are still too many cases where your destination in life is decided by where you started it. So today, I'm outlining a new approach to equality in this country. This will be founded firmly on conservative values. It will be about individual dignity and humanity, not quotas and targets or equality of outcome. It will reject the approach taken by the left, captured as they are by identity politics and loud lobby groups. It will focus fiercely on fixing geographic inequality and addressing the real problems people face in their everyday lives, using evidence and data. If you were born in Wolverhampton or Darlington, you have been underserved by successive governments. No more, things must change and things will change. This new approach to equality will run through the DNA of this government. The moral and practical case for equality. For me, it's a moral and practical mission. Just as our forebears fought for change, we must fight for change again, challenging what is unfair and unjust today. It's not right that having a particular surname or accent can sometimes make it harder to get a job. It's appalling that pregnant women suffer discrimination at work or that women may be encouraged to dress in a certain way to get ahead or that some employers overlook the capabilities of people with disabilities. It's outrageous in the 21st century that LGBT people still face harassment in public spaces. As well as being a moral problem, it's shameful that we're squandering so much talent. If women open businesses at the same rate as men, we could add 250 billion pounds to the economy. If people of every ethnic group were fully represented across the labour market, that would mean an extra 24 billion pounds of income a year. If businesses were fully accessible for disabled consumers, they could benefit from an estimated 274 billion pounds a year of spending power. We can ill afford to waste this potential as we recover from COVID and build back better. 
Our new approach to equality will be based on the core principles of freedom, choice, opportunity, and individual humanity and dignity. We will move well beyond the narrow focus of protected characteristics and deliver real change that benefits people across the United Kingdom. We will do this in three ways. First, by delivering fairness through modernization, increased choice and openness. Second, by concentrating on data and research rather than on campaigning and listening to those with the loudest voices. And third, by taking our biggest and broadest look yet at the challenges we face, including the all too neglected scourge of geographic inequality. Now is the time to root the equality debate in the real concerns people face, like affording a home, getting to work, going out safely at night, ending discrimination in our offices, factories and shop floors, and improving our schools so every child has a good chance in life. It's our duty to deliver, because if right thinking people do not lead the fight for fairness, then it will be led by those whose ideas don't work. The ideas that have dominated the equality debate have been long in the making. As a comprehensive school student in Leeds in the 1980s and 1990s, I was struck by the lip service that was paid to equality by the city council, while children from disadvantaged backgrounds were let down. While we were taught about racism and sexism, there was too little time spent making sure everyone could read and write. These ideas have their roots in postmodernist philosophy, pioneered by Foucault, that puts societal power structures and labels ahead of individuals and their endeavors. In this school of thought, there is no space for evidence as there is no objective view. Truth and morality are all relative. Rather than promote policies that would have been game-changing for people's lives, like better education and business opportunities, there was a preference for symbolic gestures. Even now, authorities rush to embrace symbols. For example, Birmingham City Council neighboring, naming New Streets Diversity Grove and Equality Road as if that counts as real change. Underlying this is the soft bigotry of low expectations, where people from certain backgrounds are not expected to reach high standards. This diminishes their individual humanity, dignity and angel agency, and it hasn't delivered the progress it promised. In 1997, there was a huge celebration of all women shortlists delivering Blair's babes. But 23 years later, the Labour Party still hasn't had a female leader. In the last leadership election, there were four women standing, but the man won, again. In addition, this focus on groups at the expense of individuals has led to harmful unintended consequences. It's led to the left turning a blind eye to practices that actively undermine equality, whether it be failing to defend single sex spaces, hard fought for by generations of women, enabling and tolerating anti-Semitism, or the appalling grooming of young girls in towns like Rotherham. Although time and time again, the left's ideas have been shown to fail, they still pervade our body politic. Study after study has shown that unconscious bias training doesn't improve equality, and in fact can backfire by reinforcing stereotypes and exacerbating biases. That's why this week we announced we'll no longer be using it in government or civil service. Whether it's affirmative action, forced training on unconscious bias, or lectures on lived experience, the left are enthralled to ideas that undermine equality at every turn. The absurdity was summed up just this week by the mayor of Paris being fined for employing so many female managers she had breached a quota. By contrast, the Conservative Party has elected two female leaders and has a cabinet with the highest ever level of ethnic minority representation. 
We've done this not by positively discriminating, but by positively empowering people who want to go into politics and opening up the party to people of all backgrounds. Because when you choose on the basis of protected characteristics, you end up excluding other people. Fairness, not favoritism, drives our approach to equality. Too often the equality debate has been dominated by a small number of unrepresentative voices and by those who believe that people are defined by their protected characteristic, not by their individual character. This school of thought says that if you're not from an oppressed group, then you're not entitled to an opinion and that this debate is not for you. I wholeheartedly reject this approach. Equality is something that everybody in the United Kingdom should care about and something all of us have a stake in. So I'm calling time on pink bus feminism, where women are less to fix sexism and campaign for childcare. Rather than virtue signaling or campaigning, this government is focused on delivering a fairer and more transparent society that works for all and delivers genuine equality of opportunity. The work of the American academic, Iris Bonet, shows that modernizing and making organizations more transparent is the best way to tackle inequality. When things are opaque, it benefits those who know how to game the system. We know, for example, that when companies publish their wage ranges, it leads to more equal starting point for women and men. We know that automatic promotions based on performance help level up opportunities for women in the workplace, overcoming the barriers that make women less likely to put themselves forward for a promotion. And we know that evidence-driven recruitment in a clear and open structure is more effective than using informal and ad hoc networks. On the other hand, techniques like unconscious bias training, quotas and diversity statements do nothing to make the workplace fundamentally fairer. By driving reforms that increase competition, boost transparency and improve choice, we can open up opportunities. And that is the approach we will be taking right across the government. To me, it's fundamentally important that the role of equality minister is held by someone who also has another cabinet job as I do with trade. This ensures equality is not siloed, but is instead the responsibility of the whole government and all of our elected representatives. For example, the Academies Act 2010 meant that good free schools were established across England and more children had the opportunity of a great education. The 1980 Housing Act empowered over 2 million people to get on the housing ladder and the independent taxation of women in 1988, sorry, gave wives control of their own money. All of these reforms promoted equality by giving people greater agency over their own lives and making systems more transparent. For example, we know that students from poorer backgrounds are more likely to achieve better grades than they were predicted, and they lose out in the current university admissions system, which is based on predicted grades. That's why Gavin Williamson is right to base the university admission system on the actual grades students achieve, making sure students from low income backgrounds have a fairer shot at university. In the workplace, we know that flexible working improves productivity and it helps people combine work with other responsibilities. That's why I'll be working with Alok Sharma, the business secretary, to enable more flexible working, not just as a necessity, amid the COVID crisis, but to help empower employees. The best way to reduce unfairness in our society is by opening up opportunities for all. This is the level playing field we should be talking about. And we're going to make sure that that level playing field is properly enforced. That's why I'm appointing a new chair and a wide variety of commissioners to the Equality and Human Rights Commission to drive 
this agenda forward. I'm proud that we have Baroness Kishwa Faulkner, David Goodhart, Jessica Butcher, Sue Mae Thompson, and Lord Ribeiro, all of whom are committed to equality and ready to challenge dangerous groupthink. Under this new leadership, the EHRC will focus on enforcing fair treatment for all, rather than freelance campaigning. To make our society more equal, we need the equality debate to be led by facts, not by fashion. Time and time again, we see politicians making their own evidence-free judgments. The Labour Party made the ridiculous claim that our country has never been more equal, with even Channel 4 concluding that it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. My superb colleague, Kemi Badenoch, is leading work on the Commission on Race and Ethics Disparities, established by the Prime Minister. And we should heed the warning from its chair, Dr. Tony Sewell, who wrote last month that they have uncovered a perception of racism that is often not supported by evidence and that wrong perceptions sow mistrust. This doesn't mean we don't recognize people's stories about their individual lives or believe that their experiences of discrimination are not real. It means that we can and must have an equality agenda that is driven by evidence. And today I'm announcing that the Equality Hub will embark on the government's biggest, broadest and most comprehensive equality data project yet. And it will work closely to coordinate with the work of CRED. Over the coming months, we'll look across the UK to identify where people are held back and what the biggest barriers are. We will not limit our fight for fairness to the nine protected characteristics laid out in the 2010 Equality Act, which includes sex, race, and gender reassignment. While it's true that people in these groups suffer discrimination, the focus on protected characteristics has led to a narrowing of the equality debate that overlooks socioeconomic status and geographic inequality. This means that some issues, particularly those facing white working class children, have been neglected. This project will broaden the drive for equality and get to the heart of the barriers people face. It will report its initial findings this summer. In addition to race, sex, disability and religion, it will also look at issues around geography, community and socioeconomic background. It will deliver a new life path analysis of equality from the perspective of individual, not groups. And using longitudinal data sets, it will help us understand where the real problems are. There is a deeper wage gap between London and the regions than between men and women, with the average full-time salary a third higher in the capital than in the northeast of England. There are lower employment rates, pay packets and life expectancy across the north and the south. At the same time, average median hourly earnings in the southwest are only just over two thirds of those in London. And that's why the equality agenda must be prosecuted with fierce determination and clarity of purpose up and down the country, not just in London boardrooms and white hall offices. Whether it's making the case for free schools in deprived areas or using data to help regional businesses attract investment, we will use the power of evidence to drive reform and give people access to the facts so they can push for change. We will drive this action from the north of England, where we will be moving the Equality Hub. And I'm delighted to announce that we're also taking on sponsorship of the Social Mobility Commission to give this agenda real teeth and coherence. The whole of government will be and is totally committed to this agenda. The Treasury is revising its Green Book so that it judges infrastructure investment fairly across the UK, no longer seeing, for example, faster broadband as a better investment in Surrey than in South Lanarkshire. The Department of Education is going to extra lengths to create academies and free schools outside London. And in housing, we're working to increase opportunities for home ownership across the country. This is just the start. There is much more we will be doing to make our country fairer and give people agency over their own lives. This fight for fairness goes beyond our shores. Next year, the United Kingdom will use its presidency of the G7 to ramp up its work worldwide 
with like-minded allies to champion freedom, human rights, and the equality of opportunity. The UK is co-leading the new Global Generation Equality Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence and co-chairing the Equal Rights Coalition. In that role, we will be holding our international LGBT conference on the theme of Safe to Be Me. We're working internationally to bring an end to child marriage and are supporting international programmes to end the abhorrent practice of female genital mutilation. We need to make progress across the world and at home because a fairer world and a fairer Britain go hand in hand. At this vital time in our country's history, we must make sure that everyone has the chance to succeed in modern Britain. That's why we can't waste time on wrong-headed, misguided, and ultimately destructive ideas that take agency away from people. Instead, we will drive an agenda that empowers people and actively ch challenges discrimination. We will use evidence to inform policy and drive change. And we will focus on increasing openness and transparency, fixing the system rather than fixing the results. And together, we will build back a better society and lead the new fight for fairness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, we've got time for a limited number of questions. We had some uh, submitted earlier, uh, uh, and we've um, had, a, had a few come in uh, during, during the talk. Um, one of the most um, well ob obvious ones would be um, you, you, you set out this this new direction now. Um, what are the, um, the the sort of first co the sort of concrete steps that you now you now think should should happen both from your department and others? I mean, you you set out what will happen with in terms of moving things around um, the GEOEC, but what what are the areas you'd like uh, to, to to focus on? So first of all, we are moving the Equality Hub to the north of England. I think for too long the equality debate has been dominated by a small number of voices and has become distant from people's lives. So it's important that we root the resources and the action to more closely to the people we want to help gain opportunity. Secondly, we are launching a major research report that is going to the first time look at the individual lives of people and track where are the barriers to success and opportunity? And we'll use that data and evidence to inform policy right across government, but it's important that the action to deliver equality doesn't necessarily come from the government equalities hub. It comes from government departments. It's things that we do in schools or health or the home office that are going to make the real difference. So it's a, it's a hub and spoke model, essentially. So we've had a question from May Bullman at The Independent. Um, she says that groups that campaign for racial and gender equality, such as the Running Me Trust and the Women's Resource Centre, have said they're concerned about your plans, arguing that addressing poverty and inequalities in the UK should not mean pitting gender and race on one side against class on the other. Um, how would you respond to this, uh, particularly in light of statistics showing the disproportionate impact the coronavirus crisis has had on women and BAME communities? What we are doing is broadening the focus of our equality work. So of course, we need to attack issues of gender disparity and racial disparity. In fact, we've recently set up, the Prime Minister established the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities. But in addition to that, we need to recognize that we have a real issue in this country with geographic inequality and severe differences in areas like life chances and education. And I think the problem has been as this debate has been framed by which group are you in, which protected characteristic are you part of, rather than saying every individual in this country should have the chances and opportunities of success. And we are going to root out the barriers to those success because you know, people aren't, somebody might be a, a woman, they might be from an ethnic minority, they might live in Doncaster. And we need to look at all aspects of people's lives and how can we use public services, how can we open up opportunities for people across the board? And I think when you just look at the protected characteristics, we're not looking broadly enough and we're not centering it on empowering the individual to help them take ownership of their future. I mean, well, so someone else asks, um, I mean, points out that, you know, this, this is the first speech on this topic um, for, for quite a while. I mean, is, is it the case that Tories have been scared to talk about these issues or shied away from, from talking about them? I think we are we are in a new era of politics. 
I mean, the the success that we had at the last election, winning over new seats in the north, it was partly a reaction to the fact that those areas had been left behind. Though I think there is a new impetus to tackle the scourge of geographic inequality. And there are many MPs newly elected in those seats who care passionately about those, about those issues. Uh, but yes, I do think we need to take on some of the existing dogma that exists in the equality debate that focuses excessively on symbols rather than the real actions we can take to improve people's lives, like making our education system better, helping people get safely to work, making sure there isn't discrimination in the workplace. And one of the issues I focused on in my speech is making sure the EHRC is really enforcing our discrimination law rather than seen as a campaigning organisation. Um, Sarah Atkinson, who's head of the Social Mobility Foundation, says, I, I, I know how committed the minister is to social mobility and welcome her direction that the Equality Hub should analyse data on class background. It's critical that as the economy recovers, businesses, businesses are encouraged to do everything they can to eliminate the barriers that often prevent talent from working class backgrounds from pro progressing. Since 2017, employers have been required to publish their gender pay gap. Um, does the minister think the time has come for businesses to publish their class pay gap? Well, I think there's a danger in, in sort of balkanizing equality and publishing lots of different data on different groups. What we should be doing and what we're doing through this research project is analyzing what the barriers are. Why is it that if you come from a particular town, you've got less chance of going to a top university. We need to analyze what are all the problems stopping that happening. And then we need to fix the system to help people get on. The problem is that the equality debate has been focused on trying to fix the outcome. And there's things like quotas and targets rather than fixing the system, which is essentially broken and not fair enough. Um, another question is, um, have you discussed this uh, new agenda with um, uh, the other, uh, with the devolved nations? I mean, what is this going to be an, an, uh, an English initiative or, or, or will there be changes we're seeing in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland as well? Well, I do have, I do have conversations with um, uh, counterparts in, in the devolved authorities and some of the issues I'm talking about are clearly devolved responsibilities, others are um, a UK-wide responsibility, and I'm committed to working closely with uh, ministers across the United Kingdom. This is a pan-United Kingdom issue. Um, Mikey Smith from the... Uh, I, I think he's the, the Mirror, but I, I can't quite He remember. definitely is from the Mirror. Uh, great. Um, I, 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 I used to be a journalist. Not, um, you've argued in your speech that inequality shouldn't be tackled with symbolism. Isn't moving institutions like the Equalities Hub uh, to the north an example of exactly that kind of symbolism? I completely disagree with Mikey. He won't be surprised to hear me say. What, what we're doing, and this is part of our overall government agenda, is we are moving the decision makers in the civil service and ministers closer to, or, or further away, if you like, from just listening to the people and voices in London. And it's not, it's not just symbolism. The fact is... The equality debate has been dominated by voices in London and the South East. It hasn't focused enough on the real challenges people face right across the country. And I do think moving the decision makers has an impact. Um, Nick King asks whether there's a, given you're moving the GEO uh, and um, with this new focus, is there an opportunity for the for it to become sort of formally involved in the levelling up agenda? Or is that, or is that, that sort of I, I see the I see the Equality Hub as a key part of the levelling up agenda. This research project we're doing will identify where are the specific problems, where are the barriers holding people back. It will help us direct government investment in the right way. It will help us also look at where the opportunities are. I mean, one of the things I points I made in my speech is. You know, two key drivers of social mobility are education and business opportunities and enterprise. So this can't be a debate that is just about public services. It also has to be about business enterprise and how we enable more people to have those opportunities. You know, if women set up businesses at the same rate as men, we would add an additional £250 billion to our economy. So those are the types of issues we need to be looking at. 
Um, and, and we've had, a, I mean, you've already slightly addressed this, but it had another question that, um, you know, is, is, is it, I mean, can you reassure people who are who are in the groups with protected characteristics that this, this isn't coming at, at the expense of the focus on them? Absolutely. I mean, frankly, everybody in the population is in a protected characteristic because the protected characteristics are sex. So that includes both men and women. You know, the protected characteristics are race. That includes both white people, uh, black people. The point is we've got to just stop looking through those lenses because I think somebody's character is more important than their protected characteristic. And this is why I think we need an equality debate that is focused on the outcomes for individuals and how do we help people succeed in the system and how do we stop looking people entirely through those lenses. So um, two, two last questions. Um, Raj Russell asks about um, the, 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 your speech and the debate generally tends to focus on equality at work. Um, what, um, what about equality at home? I mean, he refers to the, um, to the uh, Children and Family Act, which obviously dealt with the, the safeguarding of vulnerable, vulnerable children. Is that, is that part of this agenda as well? Yes, yes. And I, I have talked about other issues like equality in the education system, uh, of course, equality in the health system, uh, equality in terms of being free from crime is also is also an important priority and uh, making sure that people do have those opportunities across the board uh, is crucial. You know, we want people to be able to live the lives that they want to live. That's the fundamental at the heart of this. And um, one final question. Um, is there, does this uh, agenda have a legislative component? Um, I mean, are, there any, are there any laws that will need to be changed in order to uh, do this the type of things you're talking about? Well, the first step is this research project we're undertaking for the next six months. But of course, you know, as the agenda develops today, I'm setting out the approach. We will look at what more needs to be done to make it happen. Liz Russ, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us too.